So, good afternoon and welcome everybody. Um, this is our joint event on sustainability in stills and short form. And essentially we're doing it, the AOP with Creative Zero, which is really fantastic. We're so excited to be here. And look at this fantastic production that Angus from Locate Productions has put on for us. And of course the venue, which has been provided by Big Sky as well. So. This is our first hybrid event, so obviously go with the flow with this in that regard. So of course we've got everybody here and people will join us on Zoom. Um, and so of course I'm delighted to say it's not quite our first seminar with Roxy. We've had an AOP and Roxy event before as well as a few of our other guests that are here today. So very exciting. Um, and also, of course, this event is going to be taking a really good in-depth look at processes and practice, as well as um, different ways in which our industry can measure um, the impact on the environment. So, obviously, this is your opportunity to be able to really show uh, and ask lots of questions very much. So, of course, our panelists will be giving fantastic examples and you have your opportunity to ask lots of questions. So, please, please do. Um, and of course, in addition to our guest speakers, we'll be demonstrating how to measure greenhouse gas emissions and use that data to benefit your clients and your business. So before we start proceedings, of course, I've got the wonderful duty of being able to tell you where the fire exits are. Do you remember all of that? <laughs> As we used to have in the past. So fire exits, you have one just in the corner there. There is another one behind. So, and then there's actually one just behind the staircase there. So, thank you, <laughs> Roxy. <laughs> uh, and also, of course, the loos are through the corridor that you just came through, so that fire, the first fire exit. Um, so, there we are, that's over and done with. Um, so, I'd also like to thank EcoFlow, who um, came in very much at the last minute to offer a little discount to everybody attending today. So, they produce these power um, packs, that portable power packs that you can take around with you, so you get 5% off for the next 48 hours. So everybody will be sent a code uh, that registered, so you'll be able to pick that up. Um, and then, of course, I want to introduce our lovely co-host, Roxy Erickson from Creative Zero, who I'm gonna hand over, who's going to, of course, run through all the speakers and the program for you today. So welcome and enjoy. Thank you very much. Stay with zero. Well, that works smoothly, given my company is Creative Zero. See what we did there? That was all on purpose. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming today. Uh, Isabel, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we love working with the AOP, and we're really happy to be here. There is so much happening in the sustainability landscape. It's quite exciting, especially within the creative industries, which is what we specialize in. But we thought it was really important to give some focus to photography. Uh, so that's why we're here today. I really, I wanna take a second to thank all the panelists that are joining us today, not just for the time today, but of course putting on productions like this take a lot of work, as you guys all know. So. Uh, we all think about our work and one of the most common things that sustainability consultants hear is we don't have time for this. And the panelists today are showing how not only do we not have time, but we don't have a choice to not have time. Uh, so they have turned part of their business imperative into lowering emissions. Now, the good news for you guys is they've made it really easy. Uh, for you guys, you have a head start, right? I hope that you guys leave here with a Rolodex of great suppliers, future partners that you can work with that are gonna make that job easier for you. Uh, we've broken this talk down into the why, the what, and the how of sustainability in stills and short form. So uh, I'll be coming back on the how. Katie Hall from Creative Zero will be coming uh, on the what. Um, and we want this to be interactive, so feel free to stick those hands up. We'll be looking for you. We'll also be taking questions from the virtual audience that's with us. Katie will be doing that during the break. I'll be attempting to do that live while we wait, uh, multitasker that I am. 
So to start us off with the why, we have James Best. James Best is the chair of CAP, the, the body that makes the rules about advertising. He's also the chair of Credos, the advertising think tank. And he was chair of the group uh, that formed AdNet Zero, which is the Advertising Association's sustainability initiative. So there's no person better placed to talk about why this should be a business imperative for everyone in the room. James Best. Hi, everyone. Boom, that's better. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. 47 years in advertising. At last, I'm allowed into a studio with real lights and things. It's great. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm the why here, not the how. And um, I've got to start, as usually I seem to have to start, with a bunch of apologies. Um, first, because I'm a bit croaky, uh, a bit of hay fever or something, but a very kind person just gave me these. So if there's a lot of rustling and rattling in the middle, it's because I'm getting a strep cell. Second, because I'm not the advertised build star, um, Stephen Woodford, he isn't here. I'm just here as an understudy, so my apologies for that. And thirdly, this is the serious apology, you are probably the most visually expert, visually oriented and aware people that I will ever speak to in my life, and I've got no pictures. <laughs> um, it was kind of ludicrous, really. I've just got words. I'm just going to have to rely on words to communicate. So um, if a picture's worth a thousand words, you're going to get about, like, one picture. Uh, so let's hope that that can do a job. Um, there might be a slide up there for AdNet Zero. So I say there's no pictures, but look, there's a shutter. I hope you liked our logo. I hope it's relevant and makes you feel that you're definitely part of AdNet Zero. Um, now, as Roxy said, I'm here to talk about the why, not the how, which comes later. But I was also under strict instructions to talk about the commercial reasons why building sustainability into all what you do is important. So I'm not going to give you lots of stuff about forests and lakes and all the things that really, really matter. I'm going to talk about the business. Um, and being a good agency lad, I'll stick to my brief. Although I may, I may just stray a bit towards the end, if you'll forgive me in five minutes' time. Okay, so why do adopting and driving more sustainable practices in your businesses make sense? I've got, I guess, three reasons, and they're all groups of people. First reason is because your clients are going to demand it. Second reason is because the agencies, art buyers, and creatives are going to demand it. And the third reason is because your people are going to demand it. And along with you yourselves, I would imagine that those three sets of people drive your business, if anything does. So it may not be just commercially savvy to listen to what they say, but commercially imperative. I might say you have to. Um, let's start with clients. I think it's true to say that without exception, advertisers, if you like, corporations, companies of all sorts, are under increasing pressure from all the people that matter to them, from their customers, from their shareholders, from their investors, and bankers, and people like that, and of course from their own people, to demonstrate that they are on the path to net zero, that they are part of this global drive to reduce the damage that we're doing. And that means that marketing departments are going to be asking to see what they can do in this context to get an edge in the world of customer attraction. It means that CEOs and finance directors, who may be even more important than marketing departments, need to be able to talk about what they're doing to their investors, their insurers, their shareholders, the city, it means that the legal, the compliance people, they've got to be able to talk to regulators. Public affairs have got to be able to talk to politicians. Human resources have got to be able to talk about what the company's doing if they want to bring in 
the young talent they need. Right across our clients' companies, this is very much on the move. They are becoming increasingly aware of their own carbon footprints. They are, in most cases, for the bigger companies, they've got public commitments, they've joined various schemes, some of them add net zero, but that's hardly going to be the most important one for most of them. But they are obviously engaged. COP26. We only recently, COP27 coming up in a few months. The race to zero. ESG financing. Climate-related financial disclosures act. Blah, blah, blah. Is what Greta Thunberg had to say about all of that. But they are actually real they do catalyze corporate action. And the client world, if you like, is on the move. Climate crisis, we know, is enveloping the natural world, but it is at last, and really importantly, enveloping the business world as well. Um, so who do we see active? We see car makers. I mean. There are far more ads for electric cars than for others now, which some people might say is greenwashing. Others could point out has been helping consumers change their views and attract them to that better alternative. And they have to do it. Energy companies have to do it. Holiday firms, travel companies have to do it. Food marketers have to do it. Fashion chains very much under the cosh. They have to act as well. And that means that they are going to reduce their own carbon footprints, sure. Their policies, their plans on that, they have to publish them. Their shareholders want to see them. And they may start with some of the big, big numbers from sourcing products around the world, from manufacturing and processing you know, energy-heavy, carbon-intensive work, through to distribution, packaging, physical things. But it goes right through the organizations and it is now emerging through marketing and communications and the carbon footprints that we are all involved in one way or another in those activities. They've, they've kind of got there. It does now mean us, not just palm oil from somewhere else. Because every image, every image we make, still all moving, not only has its own immediate carbon footprint, which we're going to see a lot more about from Ad Green, but every time it's viewed, it has another little footprint. These things add up. It matters what we do, how we do it. And Ad Net Zero is the industry's collective response to that. Um, it's got a single ambition, pretty straightforward, to change the way we work and to change the work we make. Um, embed sustainable practices and messages where we can into what we do. And it's under the um, sort of umbrella of the Advertising Association, which is good because it means it brings in the client community as well as the agency community, as well as media owners, and as well as everybody else, yourselves, and other specialists right through the supply chain of advertising. It's the all-embracing pan-industry umbrella, if you like. Um, and it's a growing list that are in Ad Net Zero, because I do have a slide, but it's covered in words. So I still just about get away with having no pictures. Um, there's over 100 members now. Some of them are giant. Whoops, I can go back to it, I think. Some of them are giant. Meta's just joined, actually. Um, some of them are a lot smaller. They all matter. They're all involved. They're all committed. They've all, as it were, made the pledge. I didn't touch a thing. <laughs> to drive carbon out of their businesses. And it's not just out of their own businesses. It means out of that which they are responsible for, which goes a long way beyond that into the supply chain, if you like. Um, I'll come back to agencies in a minute, but just staying with clients for a moment, as you may have spotted from that list, some pretty significant ones are in, from food, consumer goods, you saw Nestle, maybe Unilever, from finance, NatWest, Direct Line, um, from energy, both Eon and 
Ovo. Um, there are many more, and I've now got lost the slides, so I've lost them. But they're also in through ISBAR, which is the organization which represents all advertisers in this country. And surprise, surprise, their procurement people are now increasingly into it as well. So when they're devising contracts, when they're running pitches, when they're looking at alternative suppliers, it's not just cost. They're very thrilled to be able to have something else to talk about, something else to look for, something else to make their decisions on, and that is evidence of action towards sustain, greater sustainability. And contracts, standard contracts, are increasingly going to reflect this. As the World Federation of Advertisers meeting this week, I think, it's all about this. So what do they expect of us? Well, they, they expect their, their suppliers um, to show that, yeah, it's real. It's not just some words. We're taking action. And it matters to them that they do because their CO2 footprints, if you're a client company, then your scope three is likely to include what you buy. So your suppliers' ways of working matter to you. You're going to be held accountable for other people's, i.e. ours, carbon footprints if you're buying it. So in that context, they've got to act and they need to tick the box that says, yep, yeah, look at around the suppliers, they're doing the right thing. Um, agencies, well, Adnesio's got every single one of the big holding groups in it. It's got all the big independents in it. And it's got a lot of smaller independents too, especially the sort of committed ones. And that pledges them to measure, as I say, their own carbon footprints, reduce them, and to look to reduce that of the supply chain. Now, particularly that means energy and travel. Incredible what the carbon intensity of international travel is in particular. But also that of the productions, as well as the media plans that they're responsible for. Ultimately, it means the creative work and its impact in the market. That's the big, the big one out there that everyone's working towards. Ad Green comes in on the production front, as you know, and agencies, production companies of all sorts are getting increasingly used now to measuring, and you're going to see a lot more about that in a minute. And often it can be pretty straightforward and fairly obvious things to do. But as I say, you're going to get more of that in a second from Katie and Angus and Sophie. But the point is, agencies are on this journey. They want their creative partners to be on the same journey with them. Nobody wants to go it alone, and it only happens if it happens for all of us. This is a collaborative effort, and it has to be. And, of course, lots of those creative partners are. You, again, you may have seen TAG and the mill up there, APR, obviously the APA, Nexus, Park Village, Hogarth, Coffee and Tea, a whole range of those of you involved in the world of production. And D&AD &D and Cam Lyons are also members because they too are committed that the awards and the way that they run those awards have got to follow the same path. So this is a big, broad church, if you like, all committed and increasingly active in this because we have to be. Finally, your people. I mentioned that third category. Well, unlike some of us, I must be the oldest person in this room, uh, most people in advertising are young and they are very concerned about their future, about the future of their young children. When we did some surveys 18 months or so ago, 70% of people in agencies expressed that concern about the nature of the work they were doing. What are agencies contributing to all this? Over 90% wanted their companies to be doing something about it, and this is one of those somethings. So, those are the three, I hope, good reasons, commercial reasons, embodied in those three groups of people as to why making your work as, as low impact in carbon as, as high impact creatively isn't just commercially sensible, it's pretty much necessary. I suspect I might say you had to. One minute, but I stray beyond my commercial brief because I don't think you're all sitting here thinking it's only about the money. I am sure there are people here, in fact, I'm sure everybody in here can see a bigger picture and your concern for nature, for the planet. I mean, it's a visual feast. 
the abundance of nature and our planet. And you are people who can capture that. And of all people, you can help because the imagery that you can create can inspire everybody. And we need that. We need everyone to get the message, to see that there are ways to live and enjoy life sustainably. And that that is how more and more of us will want to be and we will want the companies that we work with to be. So there's a commercial imperative, I would say, and much more widely than that, there's a human imperative. So, that's my thousand words, and you could have done that in one picture, and perhaps you will, which would be great, but thank you for listening to all those words. You guys want to come on up? Yeah, Katie. Great. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, what a nice way to finish off that talk. It actually filled my um, heart with love. So thanks, James. Um, my name is Katie. I'm from Creative Zero. Um, we are going to be talking about the what to James's why. So what tools, what changes, what things we can do to make sure that we're creating in a sustainable way. Uh, so I will let the other panelists introduce themselves, Angus. Hello, my name's Angus. I'm a producer and co-founder of Locate Productions. Set up in 2005, we're a service production company based in London and Brighton. Um, worked in 40 countries and have been using the Alberts Carbon Calculator for two years before Ad Green developed theirs helped on the working group with AdGreen, designing theirs, and have been using it since last September. Great, thanks. <laughs> um, so, hi, my name is Sophie. I am uh, the training and development manager at AdGreen. Um, I was the project manager for the development of the calculator, which launched at the end of September, but we've had a bit of reshuffle, so I'm now doing this instead. I get to talk to people about it. But before that, I was a producer working in uh, commercials, broadcast, and branded content as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, Sophie, you're going to chat us through the uh, Agri and Carbon Calculator, and then Angus is going to take us through a case study, and then we'll have a bit of a discussion around that. Um, so, Sophie, take it away. Great. Thanks very much, Katie. Yeah, so I just wanted to give a little bit of context. Can I just find out if anyone here is already using the Ad Green Carbon Calculator? Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, lovely. So some of you are already familiar with what we're doing, uh, using it, and we'll be talking uh, for the bulk of our kind of uh, half hour about that. But I wanted to give a little bit of a context and introduction into Ad Green as part of this, just in case you're not doing that already. So a um, little bit about us. Essentially, um, we're an organization who unite the advertising industry to eliminate the negative environmental impacts of production. So we're all about the positive and the solutions to the climate crisis. We've got two aims, which are to support the industry in measuring carbon emissions and then in reducing them. Um, so that, hence the calculator. Um, we have a partnership with BAFTA's Alberts, which is massively supercharging us. We're hosted by the Advertising Association. We're supported by an enormous amount, well, all the key trade bodies, including the AOP, so thank you. Um, and uh, powered by a levy, um, which is generally collected by agencies, so you don't necessarily need to worry about that. But essentially, the brands themselves are paying for the work that we are doing through that levy. Um, we're part of the Ad Net Zero Action Plan, so there were five actions, uh, what James has been talking about. We are action two, so we are cur curbing the emissions from advertising production, um, and that is uh, commercials, and it is um, radio and audio, but it is also very much stills production as well, so very relevant to um, all the work you're doing. 
Um, we've got uh, various different elements, the things that we offer. So the calculator is one of them, but also we offer two-hour training sessions, which Katie um, also facilitates. So do come along to one of those. They're completely free. Everything that we do is free because of the levy. Um, and uh, we offer various other creative energy offsetting schemes, loads of resources on our website as well. Uh, and we've got things coming. So we've got certification as well and other plans in the future. Um, so but through our partnership with Albert, this is kind of a bit of a lead in to, to you, Angus, just to explain um, a little bit about what we are doing with the calculator is gathering information. And Albert have already been doing this for 11 years in the film and TV industry, and they've been able to build a really interesting picture of the carbon footprint of their whole industry. We're now working to build one for us. So if we just look at this um, from 2020, that's the last bar graph at the end, we know that an hour of television uh, in 2020 averaged 4.4 tonnes of CO2 equivalent in its production. So that's a really good uh, kind of metric to know. Uh, we also know as part of the training that Katie goes through that an, one person's individual carbon average footprint in the UK is 12.7 tonnes. So when we start to look at these numbers, and there's all sorts of books and websites you can use to do that, you start to kind of build up a picture of um, benchmarking and then also being able to make comparisons and get a, an idea, a carbon literacy in the way that you would know how much things would cost when you went to the shops, you'd know how much your coffee is, you know how much your house is, you need to know how, well, I think it's useful to know um, how much the carbon footprint is for the work that you're doing and um, things all through your life to enable you to make positive and useful choices. Um, so. Uh, one of the key things that we have really noticed from this data is that um, in our industry as a whole, we've been very focused on disposal. And I'm sure you're all familiar with not printing out your call sheets, doing it electronically, saving paper, uh, recycling on set, and uh, bringing a reusable water bottle. They're really important pieces of the puzzle. And actually, they're a great way of getting people thinking about this subject. But in terms of the carbon footprint itself, from the data, we can see that it's tiny. It's so tiny, you can't really see it if you look at it in comparison to the other areas. So what we know from that is that we need to focus on people transport or transport in general, and then all of the activity we're doing in our spaces. So studios running on renewable energy is a massive way of bringing down the carbon footprint of that space. So that's the way that we're thinking. Um, and the other thing, which is kind of my personal uh, kind of exciting uh, part of this too, is that uh, we know from Albert that one individual production manager who's been handed um, the task of working out a footprint and bringing it all down on behalf of everybody else can actually only remove 15 to 20% of the carbon from the footprint of that production. So it's a lot to do with everybody else as well. It's not just the production manager. It is a huge influence by from the creatives, the people who've come up with that idea. Not only that, the brand, the people that are paying for it in the first place. Um, and all of the work that you can do with the suppliers, the whole team working together um, will be able to achieve the largest amount of bringing down the carbon footprint. It's not just the production manager or that green runner who's doing a fantastic uh, job as part of the team. Um, so that's pretty much me. Just a reminder, actually. So these are in order. So transport is the biggie. Um, spaces is also massive and just really good to bear in mind that spaces are um, our studios. They're also what the spaces that we're using for our post-production um, and they are for our, our working spaces as well. Um, and then also materials we're measuring and disposal. So they're all really important and they come in that order. So um, we have uh, launched this calculator. It's been going for six or seven months now. I wanted to show you what it looked like if you haven't already been in, uh, just so you can go in and um, find out more. You can access it through our website. There's just a little tag in there to sign up for your free account. And when you go in, I wanted to show you, this is my last slide before we get on to Angus, what it will look like. So 
what I love about it um, is that we've actually kind of repurposed the back end. So Albert's calculator and ours share the same um, carbon factors and all the kind of data crunching that's going on in the back end. But what we've done is we've created a bespoke um, framework for the front end. So it brings together all the different company types that work together uh, on advertising production. And we've got in there at the top, these are little circles are the logos of the companies. This is a uh, kind of draft one that we use for um, demonstration purposes. So we've got the ad agency up there. They're what's known as the principal production partner. They set up the carbon footprint um, uh, in the calculator. Uh, the brand who are just kind of watching and reviewing, they don't really do anything other than uh, enjoy the data that they're paying for. Um, and then the production consultancy who are there to help you, work with you on there if, if you uh, want them to. And then um, the people entering the information are the agency, the production company, and the service production company. So they're the people uh, just there in the middle with a bar graph next to each of them showing their portions of the footprint based on their part of the budget um, of whatever areas factor out to them. And then down the bottom, you can see within a campaign, there'll be a number of different projects. And they're signified here, we've got um, a stills project, an audio project, and a motion project in this particular campaign. So this is what we can measure. Um, and then we can bring everything together with some useful data. So I'm just gonna point these out. There's the principal production partner, the brand, production consultancy, emissions, all the projects. The measured activity areas, those, those four, we've separated the uh, spaces out into more. So there's seven in total. And then the total campaign emissions there for everybody to look at who can all log in and look at it together to view that information. Hopefully take it into meetings and uh, chat with each other about it and use it to make decisions, which is exactly the way I think Angus has been using it and is going to tell us a little bit about now. Thank you. Cool. <laughs> Um, so, I thought we work in stills, small scale motion, small jobs, lots of them perhaps, and wanted to try and do a couple of slides that perhaps show how what everything Sophie's talked about relates to our sector. So, something that perhaps we can all, the AOP audience, can actually relate to a little bit more. So, this slide, this is one of the, I think the great things about the calculator is you can very easily see some very simple stats. So these are some examples that we took from the calculator and very easily show the savings you can make with some very simple decisions. Um, just it sort of, I suppose, puts what Sophie's been showing you into a little bit of reality, yeah? Um, so I, I've done a little case study. Um, a month ago, we did a one-day shoot in a studio. We had a crew of eight, cast of two, and we were shooting one key visual and a little bit of motion, a bit of animation. This is what a standard carbon calculation for a shoot like that would look like if your pre-production office didn't run off renewables, if you pretty much drove to the studio, if you had a lamb lunch and a pork breakfast, if the studio didn't run off renewables, and um, if you didn't do any recycling. And that comes to around 0.6 tonnes. So quite small numbers compared to what Sophie was showing us, but think about how many one-day shoots that we commission in this industry in, this, you know, in, in London. And then you can start to think how this would add up. So the actual shoot that we did at Locate, we run off we have good, good energy. So our pre-production pre -produ office was um, off renewables. We did the shoot here at Big Sky, Studio 8. They've run off ecotricity, so run off renewables as well. We had a vegetarian menu. And we uh, pretty much got everybody to come by train or if cabs, electric cabs. And the savings was it brought down to 200 kilograms. Still not big numbers, but a really big saving. And those are really simple things to do. It wasn't like there was anything massively challenging there. There were a few little tips and tricks to make it easier, which we'll come on to later. But um, it just shows that we can cut our, cut our carbon with a few 
key decisions quite easily, quite quickly, doesn't affect the quality of your work, doesn't affect the, your client relationships, and doesn't really make it any more expensive. This is uh, another case study, which I just wanted to compare with the previous one. So this was with all our measures put in place, we, we tried to use public transport where we could. We tried, we obviously have renewable energy, vegetarian menu. But this was a one day shoot in the West Country. Same crew size, we had about eight crew, two cast. I think we shot two ads and a, and a couple of cinemagraphs. But because we had a travel day down, and a travel day back, and it was unavoidable for everybody to take public transport, the emissions were 0.86 of a tonne. And the reason for showing you this is that, just picking up on what Sophie said in her talk, that transport is the biggest thing for our sector. We've been using the Albert calculator, the Ad Green one now, and you, over about 30 projects we've done, you look at the data, and 70 to 80% on average, 70 80% of our emissions are through transport. So we need to be looking at that. Transport plans, lift sharing, train instead of car, electric vehicles, things like that. It, we can all bring along our water bottles and that's a, you know, we were gonna have a water bottle competition today to see who had the best water bottle. But really, if we're not talking about transport and really addressing that, then we're not gonna get close to the, the changes we need to make. Yeah. Thank you. Do I go back off that? Yeah, that's yeah. the end, isn't yeah. it? Um, so, looking at the carbon calculator and kind of the data that you need to put in, it all sounds a bit like, oh, I've got to gather loads of data. Who gathers the data and how do you do it? Because it sounds really time consuming, Angus, and I don't have time. So, uh, yeah, I agree. Um, actually, inputting the data into the calculator is really easy, it's really well designed. Loads of, e loads of effort has been put into it. It's getting the data off your crew or your suppliers or your studios that takes time. And if you don't do that at the point you're shooting, at the point you're booking that studio, at the point you send out your health deck forms, we all suddenly had to send out health deck forms for COVID. We've tweaked ours to be a crew info form now. And in there you add, what's your address? What's your proposed mode of transport fuel type? Gathering that data, we allocate a production member of the production team on shoots, on the shoot day to go around, check, did they actually come by train, car, whatever. Gather the data on the day, and then actually sticking it into the calculator when you're wrapping, you're doing your invoice, you've got it all there, it's, it's 20 minutes, half an hour. So we, we work in a way where we don't actually do estimated carbon calculations on our jobs. There's just no way. You know, we, our shoots, I sometimes have to do 15 different quotes for a one day shoot. There's no way I'm gonna do 15 different carbon calculations when they choose to swap out one talent and then move the location and do this. But the fact that we've done them in now 30 jobs, we can actually look at it and make different, make decisions moving forward on how it changes our production practice moving forward. Yeah, I guess the inputting in that early stage, we're hoping from an ag green point of view, certainly is agencies at that kind of ideation stage are doing their footprints, looking at their ideas and then rewriting them essentially to be more sustainable, we hope. So when it comes down to us in production, it's much easier for us to make those decisions, right? So when you're making those decisions, who's, what's your first port of call or who's your, who do you, what do you think of first and who do you call first? Um, I think we need to start asking our studios, locations, hotels, if they run off renewables before you book them. Premier Inn, run off renewables, quite cool. It's quite useful, they're in most cities around the country. Is it bona fide, just proper renewables? Roxy, one for you. Um, <laughs> but asking the questions at the point of you doing your pre-production, before, once you've booked your studio, you're going there. Ask them before you book it, do they run off renewables? The more conversations we create, the more of, often this gets asked, the more likelihood they're gonna start changing their policies. Yeah, definitely. I think that's something in the training we try to hammer home is you could be a massive agency asking, are you on renewables? Or, and you might be the first agency or you might be the eighth producer of a tiny production company that's asking that question that week. So it doesn't matter what size you are, what matters is you ask the question, definitely. Um, does it cost more generally 
or what is the cost saving in doing? I think it's it's negligible. I, I, I would say the big cost issue that we have is train instead of car. Yeah. So we did a shoot in Manchester two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and for the location manager to travel up to Manchester at the end of the day for a recce the next day and came back was going to be about 200, over 200 pounds for a tra return train, and he could have jumped in his car and it would have been 40, 50 quid. So I think until we... It's a bigger question outside of our industry, but until train travel costs comes down, we're going to be pre prohibited in making those decisions, but it's a massive, massive saving. Other than that, a vegetarian menu doesn't cost any more than meat. It may even be cheaper. Um, ask your caterer to provide you with two or three vegetarian options. They'll provide you with a veg, fish, and meat option. Why can't they provide you with two veg and a vegan or three veg options? Still, you can have the variation and, you know, the, the, the choice there. Yeah. So. And Sophie, from an ad green point of view, what's the most important thing when production companies or individuals are working with a calculator? What's the most important thing that they can do? Is it all the data? Uh, yeah, so I think we would say start early, but I totally get what you're saying, Angus, about the fact that it, often it's the agencies that need to do that thinking <laughs> before it kind of comes down to you to kind of make it happen. So that's... Um, a really interesting way of looking at it, actually. So it's, but it, from that point of view, I guess it's planning. So it's putting it into your invoices, putting it into your kind of forms that people are filling out before the job starts and having that in your mind early on, uh, whatever stage that is for you. Um, and then the other one, Katie, sorry, is... Well, so what's the most important thing, do you think, for production companies to be focused on? On with oh the yeah, it, and when you said about data, you said about whether it's kind of clean data. So um, we've got a lot of people who are getting tied up in, oh God, I don't have all that exact information and I need to know, you know to the mile how far everybody traveled and exactly what vehicle it is. I mean, yes, if you want to get into that nitty gritty, by all means do, but we don't want it to stop people from using the calculator. So in terms of it being like the one thing I'd love everyone to do is to just get in and start using it. And if that's imperfect at the moment, that's fine. Just get in and start and get going because it's a learning process and we really need to be kind to ourselves and each other uh, with this uh, stage that we're at at the moment. So we're getting used to it and that's okay. I uh, you know there's lots of things that we can do to help each other to ask those questions and kind of grow our knowledge. So I would say get in, get using it, be kind to yourself, don't get too tied up. Um, the, the better the data is, the better our whole kind of um, picture will be of the industry, but that will come in time. The, the more used you are to doing it, the more uh, you'll just find that you're able to do it. So yeah. Yeah. Talking about questions, does anyone have any questions for either Sophie or Angus in the audience? Yes, the gentleman at the back. Thanks, Jan. You will be given a mic. Check, check. Hold it. Hi. Um, from a crew perspective, because I'm very much like, you know, boots on the ground um, crew member, how far can you manipulate this data? So if you're a producer and you're not on set, you're relying on a lot of like fake, maybe made up statistics. How can you navigate away from that? You can't really police a set. Yeah, okay, good question, thank you. Um, well, we are trusting people to put the data in uh, to the best of their knowledge. Um, but one of the things that we've put in place actually is we've asked, um, we, we've set the companies that can use um, the calculator. At the moment, it, really it is... <laughs> Sorry. Um, at the moment, um, it's just five company types. So it's the ones that I showed you at the beginning. You've got the brand and the um, production consultancy who've got oversight. But then the people who are entering the data are the agencies, the production companies, and the service production companies. So actually, they're the people who we're trusting to comb through the data, make sure that it's clean and it's as, uh, to the best of their knowledge, correct as well. So um, I know there'll be individuals here who are working on shoots who are perhaps wanting to contribute and, and have a look in, in the calculator at the moment individuals who, uh, who aren't affiliated with a, with a company are not able to have accounts and it's because of that um, kind of data protection side of things. So I hope that answers it. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? 
Yes, the lady with dark hair and a white shirt. Thanks, Jess. Um, is the calculator only meant for stills production where a shoot's required, or should we be using it for if we're commissioning CGI or another form? Yeah, thank you. Another good question. So it's um, for any content or uh, collateral that's made for advertising production. So um, if it is being commissioned by a brand and used for advertising purposes, then uh, by all means calculate it. So it could be for anything. It doesn't have to be a still. It could be elements that are used for VFX. Um, of course, absolutely. And um, those three different types that we had down at the bottom of that previous slide, um, there is um, a, an ability to, we know that sometimes someone's doing a, um, a kind of video shoot and they're capturing some stills as part of that. I know we've all got kind of maybe different opinions about that, but you know, it happens. So you can put uh, those two things uh, together and measure them simultaneously as part of that one piece of production work. Okay, um, we are running out of time for any more questions, unfortunately. If you have oh, one more, has anyone else got a question? We are around later as well, if you want to we like are, a yeah. type question. And online questions, we're going to be answering in a special online session for Zoom people only, um, which we will go to shortly. But before we do, if there's one thing that people change as a result of coming today, what would you hope they would change? Angus, please. Uh, I think if we all made a commitment to not eating red meat f at work, unless it's a very special occasion, that would make make sense. Like, I don't know, do we really need lamb or beef for lunch? You know, not knocking it, I love it on a Sunday and a Friday night and stuff, but that would be a good commitment. I also just want to say something about it's going to need us to step outside of our comfort zones. This isn't just business as usual, fill in a form and we've done it. We're going to have to work differently. We're going to have to learn how to do what we all have learned for the last 10, 20 years in a different way. It's going to mean asking awkward questions. It's going to mean challenging the status quo and how we do stuff. It's going to be having awkward chats at pressure times. You know, we've got to accept that. This isn't just an easy thing and it's going to happen. But when you do it, it's really cool and everybody's on board. And when you get everybody on a shoot, and the calculator is designed to collaborate between client, agency, and production. When you all get together as a team and you work towards a common goal, it's fantastic. Fighting the good fight. Yeah. <laughs> Sophie? I'm going to follow on from that, actually, Angus, because I, I love you for that. Totally. My thing would be get in there and start using it, and then to be proud about it and tell everybody that you're using it. Bring it up in meetings. Use the data. Use it in your own way. I know different people are kind of contacting me and talk, talking to me about that. Share that story. We're really interested in case studies. We'd love to hear about the work that you're doing, and then we'd love to share that more widely with you. Uh, one more thing. Uh, the, <laughs> communicate, the, the call sheet email that you send out is the most important bit of comms on the whole shoot, yeah? It tells where people where to be, what time, what's happening. Put it on there. Tell people that's what you're doing, that there might be a vegetarian menu. Communicate it at that point because everybody reads that. What That's the one email everybody reads. Stick it on that one. <laughs> so out of those one things, choose all of them and do them all. It doesn't matter what you do. Just do one thing, right? Um, thank you. And we're going to take a short break. We'll be answering questions online in between that break. But I believe there's tea and coffee at the back. Upstairs, coffee, there's tea upstairs and coffee. In the bar. Upstairs in the bar. Thank you, everyone. And thank and you, guys. Back, back, on, back on at 4.30. I'm back here at 4.30. And uh, people on Zoom, Katie and I will be popping through to do Q&As on the, on the Zoom chat. Yeah. Maybe if I whisper and be like a primary school teacher, it's suddenly kids, kids. All right, great. Hope everybody got a chance to stretch your legs, get a drink, thanks to uh, Big Sky, locate. Um, so my section is about the how, how our companies 
actually doing some of these things. And this is kind of fun because as a consultant, I'm often on the phone explaining to companies how to do this. And today the companies get to explain it to me. So I get to sit back, take it easy while they tell you how the hard work goes. Uh, so let's get back in. I am joined by Drew Morgan from Grip Van, Alice Timms from The Styling Bank, uh, Kai Bastard from Bad Star Studios, and Liam Bergen from Perma Collective. Uh, and they're going to start by doing a little mini presentation um, on what they're already doing and why they're here today. And then after that, I'm gonna have some questions and I wanna hear questions from you guys too, so feel free to you know, get those hands up and I'll be looking around. And as I said before, it's quite exciting because I'm also going to be attempting to ask some of the questions that are coming in from the virtual audience. So virtual audience, feel free. Hopefully this is gonna work really smoothly and I'm gonna see them all here. Uh, apologies later when that doesn't happen. <laughs> so uh, with that in mind, Perma, uh, Liam, do you want to uh, kick us off? Okay, so hi, my name is Liam Bergen and I'm one half of Perma Collective. We're a stills production company and uh, sustainability at its core. And by that, we constantly review our behaviors and our approach to productions with our impact in mind. And we invest our time and our money ensuring we're progressive in our intentions. So we try to uh, educate, encourage and inspire those around us to be more environmentally responsible. And we reflect, learn, and collaborate to innovate low-carbon methods. And we public, re publicly report our true impact to try and inspire others to measure. So in 2020, we listened to Roxy and Angus at the first sustainability event in which they discussed the need for our industry to be greener, to help combat global warming. Two years later, we've done a lot of learning. And I like to say, we're not activists, we're more disciples of the cause. And by that, I mean every business has a responsibility to address climate change. And with resources like Ad Green and Creator Zero, all freelancers, photographers, and creatives can be or should be assessing and reducing their environmental impact. So Camilla and I use our environmental policy to drive our business decisions. When a brief lands, we start a conversation and we think about our approach and the services that we can offer. For new customers, we're keen to point out that our processes might be slightly different and we estimate our projects with carbon in mind. Today, all of our customers have trusted in us and supported our approaches and are very much open to the conversation around sustainability. In advertising, sustainability is now a talking point. And we believe as producers, we have influence. So we're the sweet spot between the clients and the crew. We can inspire and support our collective to work differently, and we can inspire and challenge our clients to think differently. Communication across the project is key. Simply but, if we all did a little bit collectively, we can do a lot. So first and foremost, we've looked at our own behaviors and areas where we can control and evoke change within. And then we challenge ourselves and our teams to devise new workflows to enable a more sustained production. The journey of sustainability is one of learning, challenge and reflection. Our intention is always to reduce our carbon before we offset. Offset is, isn't, in our view, sustainable. You should be looking at reducing through behavior change. And to echo Angus, you need to break your comfort zone. So COVID gave us all an opportunity to change the behavior around production. 
So embracing this opportunity and approaching shoots differently was in our eyes the only way forward. We believe you should shout loudly, help those around you to be better. Our industry is advertising, we're storytellers. So we use our platform to share a message when we use our platform to share our learnings for others to adopt. Make the conversation around sustainability normal. If we all do a little bit, we can achieve a lot. So five giveaways. Be fair and care. Creators are generally a sensitive and caring bunch, and they're open to a conversation around change. Quote with carbon in mind. Empower the people around you to challenge the process. If the process is correct but it costs more, then we should embrace this cost and explain the rationale to our customers. We should engage in the conversation and find the solution. We should be putting the planet and the people first. Approach all your projects with complete transparency. We, we have no hidden costs, no hidden markups, and we find that it's efficient for all involved. Transparency builds healthy relationships and in our experience, allows us to communi communicate clearly the cost impact of certain cho uh, creative choices. Be clear. Our ethos is built on collaboration and communication. We support our teams and we hold the hands of our clients. We've built a reputation for being detailed and approachable. And between Camilla and I, we bring 20 years of shoot production to the table, spanning both studio and location. And we're supported by a brilliant network of creatives that enable us to uh, deliver efficiently. The last slide. Be better. Choose to challenge. Choose to break old habits in place of new solutions. Report your true emissions, understand your impact, and learn from the process. At Perma, we 100% subscribe to the idea of build the business that you want to see in the world. So we support and invest in businesses that are putting the planet and the people first. And we would like to share and support other people on that journey. Take it away, Kai. Bad hey. start. I'm going to come around the side so I can see what I'm doing. I'll grab the clicker. <laughs> cool. Dun, 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 dun. Do all the text. Stay cool. Up. Thanks for everyone for coming. Um, I'm Kai Bastard. I head up at Bad Star Studios. We're in Leighton Stone and we do multi channel. Um, post-production, uh, we focus on like CGI, retouching, so we're like best friends to photographers. Um, so I'm going to sum up a few things and I'm going to run through a little bit of a case study that we've got. So since our inception, we've been conscious with the agenda of being sustainable, so we've been working with other external providers to actually monitor and assess the business as an overall, looking at all our scopes to ensure that we are carbon neutral as a company. And we've also built a dry hire studio, um, which is this. And we built it with recyclable materials. And we also look at the consumption through like renewable energy, et cetera. But at the end of the year, we're hoping to be um, carbon positive with um, solar panels and uh, green exterior for uh, green living wall on the outside. So with, with our measurements, we've got this project, which I thought would be like a summary of what we can provide. Like there's been a lot of talk about travel's the biggest uh, carbon output. So this is a project which we undertook for Panasonic. And we had to create the Arizona desert in CGI. So without the need to travel, we've got a little breakdown of what we did inside the studio. So this little. So this 
So this is all built in 3D, all the textures, all the maps. And then within the studio, we actually did a green screen shoot, which was just one day shoot. We had a really small crew on this. And then at the same time, we actually undertook like some uh, video as well. So the first commission was just for stills only. And then we looked at giving value back to the client with extending it by pushing it into uh, a video. So this goes to the final, the final finished piece. So 3D is a great way, like you can look at, instead of having to travel, looking at even set building, you can look at optimizing 3D, you can get multiple angles, you don't have to go on a location, you could even go and do LiDAR scanning of a location, bring that into 3D, composite the actual uh, photographic elements together. You don't always have to build props either. We can look at 3D props and alternatives. But how we measure is like everybody is emitting carbon at all times. How, how the measure, measurements are, are undertaken is through different scopes. So you've got scope one, which is owned and um, sources owned or controlled. And scope two is uh, generation of purchase, electricity consumed by the company. And then scope three, which is what we apply to our clients is everything which is part of us. So this is our accountability of what we provide. So with a project, which we, I just showed you of the case study, we look at breaking up that third scope into three distinct areas, which is pre-production, shoot, and post-production, and this is how it's kind of delivered. So we measure through uh, Ad Green and other, other calculators, and we can produce results which have minimal impact. So doing the virtual production through Panasonic is on the right-hand side, creating 283.85 kgs of carbon, and we put a 10% caveat on top of that. So that's the equivalent of 142 10 minute hot showers in total. And then if we actually went on location, flying a photographer, art director, and an assistant over to California, like everybody has been saying, the travel is the big, the big one and the big number here. And then it really reduces the, like, the post production's very no nominal. Um, yeah. So it kind of gives you an overview where 3D can actually prosper for your clients and for the photography as well. You can look at alternative ways to produce your, your shoots. So yeah, digital set building, digital props, uh, flexibility for creatives, uh, reducing timeframes as well. You can go into virtual production as well with this stuff. Um, we're, we're reducing emissions and we're enhancing and extending the del delivery for different formats for clients as well. That's me. So Alice, the styling bank. Hi, thank you. Clicker. Clicker. Um, so I'm Alice Timms. I'm a stylist and I'm also the founder of the Styling Bank, which is a new initiative that I've set up to repurpose and recycle post-shoot wardrobe stock and then rehire it on shoots to other stylists to cut down on waste. I've been working in styling on commercial shoots for over 20 years. And in that time, I've become increasingly aware of not only how wasteful <laughs> Wasteful my department is, um, but also what a damaging impact the fashion industry has as a whole on our planet. Clothing has the fourth largest environmental impact after housing, transport and food. After some research into the environmental impacts within my department, I realised just how large the problem is. If you imagine that there are currently hundreds of stylists working around London and shoots happening every day, that is a massive amount of clothing being repeatedly purchased, returned, rehomed or disposed of post-shoot, with at least 70% of purchases being re returned. This image of me, <laughs> mid-returns, from a shoot a few years ago, shows the amount of clothing typically 
uh, sourced on one of my sheets. And it explains um, how I came to realize that something is broken in the current system and methods we use to provide clothing for sheets. Um, and it returns, highlights the returns that are happening every single week. Um, so after being inspired by some training by BAFTA Albert and after attending one of these events a couple of years ago, um, I, um, and um, listening to the, oh, sorry. <laughs> It was that one. Um, so the words of Ursula de Castro, the co-founder of Fashion Revolution, who said the most sustainable clothes are the ones already in your wardrobe. I set about creating the styling bank to help find a way to make sustainable shoot clothing accessible while still trying to meet the demands of the advertising industry. There are various ways we can tackle the current styling shoot waste problem and the styling bank wants to address these and try to help wherever we can. I realized that we would have to compete with the current um, linear method, which is to buy, shoot, and dispose of. But we need to be more circular, where we hire, shoot, wash, and repeat. Um, so the products are kept instead in use at their highest value until the end of their life, and then they are repurposed or disposed of considerately. There are vast environmental impacts caused by the current return system. When we return clothes online, they are sent via a courier to a warehouse, creating transport emissions. They are then unpacked and processed, causing pa packaging waste. They are then cleaned, repacked, and resent for resale. Or some retailers may even send them to landfill if stocking, restocking them isn't financially viable. This slide highlights um, some recent photos from um, a place in South America where you can see new clothing has just been sent to landfill. Unreturnable used shoe items often get donated to charity charity shops that can't cope with the volume of textile waste here in the UK. So it's sent to other countries where the overwhelming amount that can't be repurposed is often sent to landfills or incinerated. It's estimated that about 336,000 tonnes of clothing are going to the UK landfills each year. So the styling bank model of accepting post-shoot suitable stock, washing it and relisting it for future use cuts, not, cuts down not only on new purchases, but also textile waste. Increasing garment lifetimes is one of the most efficient means of reducing their environmental footprint. Extending the life of clothing by an extra nine months could reduce carbon, waste and water footprints by around 20 to 30 percent per garment. Carbon emissions could be decreased further with better clothing maintenance and mending. So could more be done? Could more be done in our in industry with our influence through the advertising world to, to use and promote normalised clothing with repairs such as visible mending, darning or patches? There are modern wardrobe hire facilities in South African shoot system, but in London we have period, costume and workwear only, not simple, modern, everyday clothing such as we use in advertising shoots. The Styling Bank supplies contemporary stock clothing, which is available to view online. Images can be easily pulled for mood boards and unnecessary travel is also eliminated. We usually only use a small selection of the many options that are purchased for a shoot, so we can reduce this volume with more pre-approval and precise virtual selections before we purchase, thereby vastly cutting down on any required items that can't be hired. We now have virtual wardrobe fittings where we can see what items talent can supply themselves. This can be used alongside the styling bank stock to cut down on purchasing new items. This enables stylists to gain better insight into what will fit the models with first-hand sizing and brand fit and reduces unnecessary purchases based on estimates or incorrect sizing, which is all too common. The styling bank also offers other stylists the opportunity to list their own stock on the website offering a wider range and helping others to find a local supplier, which will in turn reduce the impact of travel. Additional factors we have considered are using sturdy, reusable bags. We aim to transport with electric couriers wherever possible, and we use eco-friendly cleaners and a guppy friend wash bag to reduce microplastic pollution. The Starling Bank is a newly launched business, so we're constantly learning and trying to improve. Also, as stylists sign up and share their stock, it will grow but I hope that it will also enable a community to share better environmental working practices as they are discovered and implemented across production. Another quote I'd like to share from Dr. Amanda Parks is that sustainability is a series of compromises based on priorities, and we need a lot of people doing some things better than a few doing everything perfectly. Thank you. All right, Drew, Grip okay. Van. Hi, um, so I'm Drew. I'm operations manager at Grip Van. And on the face of it, we're a lighting rental company, but we're really a lighting rental company, a, uh, sorry, 
a logistics company, we're a crewing company, we're a consultancy, and we get involved in technical production. Um, and that point Alice made at the end there about trying to do stuff you know, as much as you can, I still feel like we're really at the beginning of our journey toward being more sustainable. I, we've been going a while, we've been going 10 years, and I think we're only just starting to see real momentum um, starting to build and people asking us to be more sustainable and starting to appreciate the things that we have been trying to do. Um, so GripFam was founded about 10 years ago. Um, it was founded uh, my colleague Andrew Howe, who's hiding at the back there. Um, so I'm speaking for him a little bit here, but it was born out of a frustration with the way things were operating in the stills world and the inefficiencies on set and a sense that there must be a way of doing it better and that by leveraging that knowledge, um, I mean, Andrew's been in the industry probably, I think, since I was in secondary school. So uh, <laughs> it's been a while. Um, <laughs> maybe primary school. It's, uh, <laughs> You know, taking some of what was existing on long form and bringing it and scaling it down for the stills world and you know, smaller commercial shoots. Um, and in doing so, making life easier for creatives, for the technical crew and for the producers. Um, so one of the things that Gripan did by taking that concept of the large grip truck and bring it to a scale suitable for stills was reduce the amount of back and forth with, oh, I forgot a spigot. <laughs> There's, oh, we need another C stand, can you run it over? So what we came up with was this, the sort of mini grip van that acted like a studio kit room on location. Um, all of the bits that usually got forgotten from a list were there on the van. That is from around 2013. Since then, we've moved to more efficient vans uh, for the most part. We've gone for vehicles that are based on motorhome chassis, so they're exceptionally light, they give us more payload, and when they're not filled to capacity, they're as efficient as they can possibly be. Um, sadly, the electric vehicle technology is not quite there for us yet. It's, it's coming, it's hopefully next year. <laughs> um, so like I say, we're a consultancy, we're a knowledge company, really. Um, people come to us for advice and we've all come from, from set. I don't think there's anyone working from Grip Band who didn't start out as an assistant, a camera operator. Um, and leveraging that knowledge allows us to recommend the best equipment for your shoot. And if you ask us for efficient equipment, we know what we've got available and we can recommend it to you. And at its core, like with the styling bank, rental is more sustainable. You're getting more use out of every item. Um, everything we use has an embodied carbon footprint, whether that's a stand that might last for 50 years or a flash pack that might be replaced in five. The more use we can get out of that equipment, the more sustainable it is, the less that footprint per shoot becomes. Um, and of course, with us, it's not in our interests, and the same with any other rental company, it's not in our interest for equipment to be sat broken. You know, we want to maintain it, we want to keep it going out. You know, if it's on set being used, it's not on our shelves. Um, and as well, we, we need to have the equipment you want to use. Um, it's economically efficient for us, and it's environmentally efficient going out on set. And so some of the things we've been trying to move toward are LED lighting. The, all the lights on today are LED based. They all run off of house power. Um, and some of them we can even run off of battery packs. So these are some of the steps we've taken. And um, I've mentioned the LED power. One of the other things we did quite early on, I think 2018, we moved to trialing electric cargo bikes for deliveries. They don't work for delivering an entire shoot's equipment, but what they do fill in very nicely are picking up sub rentals, delivering that spigot that you forgot, um, running cameras and small lights around, 
our cargo bike has done over 3,000 miles now. And consider that's usually five mile trips in London. It's taken roughly a ton of CO2 off the road compared to using one of our vans. Yeah, it's, it's not ethical to send a three and a half ton van across London to deliver a camera or a light. Um, we have a small team, 60% of us cycle or get public transport into work. Um, and that's, that's not by accident. You know, we offer secure cycle storage inside the building. We have tools on site. We have you know, the cycle to work scheme. Everything just little nudges that make people or give people the opportunity to make sustainable choices easily. Um, we have, for the last couple of years, run a or contributed to a rewilding scheme in Scotland. And you'll see that on your quotes um, with a number of trees that your, your job has enabled us to plant. At the moment, we're in about 2,000, 2,100 trees um, up in the Caledonian forest. And then last thing, we've started working with Roxy. So that is new this year, because all of these steps, they felt like the right thing to do, but we've never been able to hold ourselves accountable. And so now we're going through a carbon audit. When that's finished, it will be on our website. You can see how good or bad we are, and we'll commit to improve that year on year and to offsetting what we can't improve. And where else? We, so 2018, we removed Corex from stock. It didn't go down too well to start with, but we offered alternatives. Um, Ramboard was one of the first options we could do, which is a cardboard floor protector. And then we moved to offering reusable mats. We'd love to do the same with polyboards. Um, so our polyboard stock at the moment is almost all rental. We try and avoid you know, selling someone a polyboard that's going to be used once and then thrown away. We'll take them back and we'll keep them going as long as we can. Um, we want to move our fleet away from internal combustion engines. We've done that so far with our smallest van. And not just because the small vans are available, but because that's the vehicle that did the most mileage. It's constantly running around London. So that was a really easy way for us to slash our transport CO2. I think it will be when we, when we know. <laughs> um, and as we can, we'll keep on doing that method. Um, our large vans tend to go to set and stay there, which cuts the, car the, uh, the carbon in half compared to a delivery and a collection. And um, continue with reduce and reuse polyboards, gels, anything we can. Sorry? Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I love our musical chairs here. This is what collaboration looks like, people. This is it, in action. Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, virtual people, is that what I say? Feel free to start writing in some questions, and I, I'll, I'll start looking. Uh, I thought maybe I would start out the questions by talking about client response. What do your clients think about all of these moves? Do they, do they care? Are they excited? Yeah. Mics. Mics, all the mics. We want all the mics. Yeah, answer. <laughs> so generally the response has been brilliant. Everybody has open ears. Um, they want to learn. They want to understand where changes could be made. Um, what the cost impact might be, what the time impact might be. So I think everybody is aware of sustainability. Everybody understands it's something that they need to incorporate into their business model. Not everybody knows how to start that, um, but that's, you know, reaching out is the first point. Everybody is, is, is available um, and we can direct them to people to, uh, you know, to answer that question. Um, but it's, it's warm. Yeah, our, our response um, from clients has been mixed, to be quite honest. Um, 
with every project that we do, we, we, we initially audit it. Um, we've got our own stats that we can apply to what a CG artist would be, retoucher would be. So we can work out what the pr uh, post-production would be. And then if we're going into the full production, we'll calculate that as well. When we estimate, we put the cost associated at that starting point. So the client's aware what they're gonna be getting. We've had some clients totally fob it off and say, can you just remove all this environmental stats and costs? And we've had other clients who've been really warm to it. And it's kind of, it, it makes us aware of like, maybe we should be working with other organizations who are, you know, focused on what our agenda is. Um, Cause it needs to change. Um, so after that, we also purchase credits from a company called Wildlife Works in Kenya. They actually create the credits. And then we give you a certificate at the end of every job, which summarizes um, the stats and the data of what the post-production was, pre-production, um, which you can take and use it in your own data metrics back to your client. Anyone else? Oh, there we go. Anyone else on client? Um, I'm a really new business, so I've only had a few bookings so far. <laughs> but the overall response has been really, really positive. I think people are really relieved <laughs> that someone's finally done this because it's really, really been a long time coming um, and it just needed to happen so badly. So um, I just want to get people hiring and reusing and, um, and encourage everyone to do it and to work together to get this done. Can I just add to that, actually? We had Alice on set last week uh, with Styling Bank. Um, and there was an opportunity for you to talk to the creative team about what you were doing. Um, and both the senior client and creative team were really impressed with that setup. Um, and actually, it's been cost effective to do that, to go through the process of renting rather than purchasing. So um, I applaud both the service and, um, and the action. Win win. I think for us, like I said, we've, when we got rid of the Corex, there was a bit of a pushback there. Um, those of you who have used Ramboard, it's not as easy as just throwing down a sheet of plastic and cutting a line. Um, but it didn't take long for, for people to go, oh, okay, yeah, there's, there's a reason for doing this. And then with LED lighting, we're, we're lucky that a lot of the time our clients are lighting guys. You know, they love new kit. Um, <laughs> so it, it doesn't take much. If you say, I've got this great light, it, it gives you the same power as a, an M18, but you can you know, run it off a battery. They're like, cool, okay, put one on. <laughs> nice. So the communication, though, educating them is quite important, letting them know oh, that it exists. Definitely. And also, like, people now get to a point where it's, have you got anything new? <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. How about how about measurement? We talked about measurement in the first panel. It's it's specifically one type of measurement. Looking at a whole production, uh, looking at a project. Are there other things that you measure? How do you find measurement is received? How important is it to you guys? So again, um, we measure our footprints. Um, I think again, it's been positive. It gives us something to shout about. Um, everybody's interested in that data. Uh, we found the language around collecting that data really interesting. We had to adjust our methods depending on who we were talking to, um, whether somebody was on board with uh, sharing that data, um, which we were able to learn by adapt our methods to, um, in fact, we've now settled on job forms. It's been a really easy way of harvesting that data. Uh, but once you put it into that pie chart into Add Green and take it to your client, everybody has something tangible to work with. Um, and, you know, again, if it's a true calculation, then you've got something to measure the next time. So you can, you can approach your shoots as to whether it is location studio, and it gives just everybody that opportunity to, to make those creative decisions. So I think generally it's received really well. Yeah, for, for us, it's... Um it's a set to the means, like it, it gives you, uh, it, it sets you instead for like the future of your other post-production, your other productions, and looking at and ascertaining where 
the highest carbon is being created and where you can where, where you can offset it with with three D. It's not always the you know it's not always a good alternative, but it's a great way to even do pre production like visualizations, ascertain and save time. So like condensing a shoot, which could be two days into one day, um, and yeah, even props like the dismantling of sets then needs to be disposed of or it needs to be recycled. That needs to be managed with 3D. You've got a permanent asset. Everyone's talking about the metaverse. We can enter that space. We can do other things with these assets, which are digital. Um, yeah, so I think it's, it's, it's progress. It's action first, even if it's small, to then take us forward. Yeah, I, I think one of the... One of the concepts that's important to getting around in measurement is that you're measuring something probably that's already happened. You can't make any changes to it. You've already made those carbon emissions. They're done. So, so while that data is important to understand, it's what you do with that data and how you use it going forward that's, that's really key. The data itself doesn't do anything. A bit like looking at a profit and loss sheet and managing businesses, looking at costs, looking at sales, this is just another addition to that to, to add a, a deliverable for your clients and also an asset to your business and understand how you're doing uh, uh, as far as your carbon emissions instead of just your financial bottom line. Um, I thought this is gonna be, I'm gonna take us off on a, on a bit of a tangent here We've talked a lot about measurement, we've talked a lot about data, but also we are actually considering a really huge issue for all of humanity. We don't want to be the generation that kills mother nature, right? That's what we're actually talking about here. And I was in the audience listening to Brian Eno and Aurora talking about what they're doing in the music industry. Uh, what strides are being taken there. Again, another creative industry, so many similarities with how they produce project management. And it was interesting listening to Aurora talk because she said she, you know, she's always been talking about these things, but she talked about them in, a, in an emotional way and in a hippie way, right? And, and media would go, oh, you know, she's that kind. She's away with the fairies. And she found her voice really devalued. And I, I wonder how how we can bring the emotion, we are storytellers. How do we bring the emotion back in? How do we value that part of this? At the end of the day, that's why we're all doing these things. It's to save humanity, guys. And, and I wonder where we go with that. Maybe something about eco-anxiety, maybe something about how the emotional side affects your business imperative. Um, I'd like to say, I mean, I've got kids, so for me, have a legacy is really important to me, like the, the earth I'm leaving to them to inherit is incredibly important to me. Um, but also it can all feel so overwhelming. Um, the emotional impact of it on us is, is it just feels like it's too much. Um, but we have to do something. This is not a question, you know, it's not something we, we have to, there's no, there's no choice in it. Um, but I think working collaboratively, collaboratively with so many people incredibly helpful um, and it just means that a job that seems impossible suddenly shared is achievable and um, you know that has a massive impact on me and doing the starting this initiative I've started has really even though it's hard and I'm learning incredibly quickly how to run a business um, an eco-friendly business at that um, you know it's just incredibly important that um, I inspire and hopefully get other people to get involved and to join me and everyone else on this journey that we're going through to kind of, you know, to pass things over to the next generation. Dun, dun, dun. I think the emotion one's quite an interesting point because everybody experiences it differently. And I think we are, we can be a little bit immune to the magnitude of the problem. Um, I think businesses do have a responsibility. We know we have a responsibility both to our customers and our, our crews. Uh, but we also have to understand that everybody will see it differently. So take litter, for instance. Some people still litter. So, you know, it's, it's why do people still do that? But they do, and you still see it. So some people will just, they won't acknowledge it's gonna happen. And you don't, you know, you choose not to engage in that battle with them. Most people recognize it's a problem and are on board. 
So you, you have to kind of you know, go to those people that are going to speak the same language. And if the more people that speak that language, the more change is going to happen. So we'll see it start small, it will grow and grow and grow. Eventually, there will be a system change. Like the plants of our diet. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I think it can be really frustrating. You know, everybody here, everybody watching is, you know, because they care about this. There are a lot of people who don't, don't see the point, maybe haven't, you know, looked into it enough to care yet, or it's just not crossed their mind. Um, and it can be really frustrating dealing with that when you're putting so much physical and emotional effort into something. Um, but you've just got to remember you're one person, one organization. You, you can't win every battle, but you can be the best advocate you can possibly be. You know, if you can show that there's a better way of doing things and other people see that, then eventually they're going to catch on. Great, for sure. Questions from you guys? I can keep going on this all day, but I'd love to hear from you guys. Yes, guy in the back. Here's the microphone, it's coming, it's coming. Hello, hello. Um, yeah, I just wanna sort of say, say something about the ad industry and how this is a brilliant opportunity um, uh, to get the message out to them. What I've, what I've found, I've worked in media and advertising for 20, 30 years, and what I find the, common, the commonality between lots of people in advertising is that they have this inbuilt sense of guilt uh, of, of kind of what they do. The, loads of my friends and people who, who ended up in advertising were those kids at school who were deeply creative and wanted to change the world, and what they ended up doing was working for an ad agency selling some perfume or something. So they've got this inbuilt sense of guilt. So this is an amazing opportunity to grab hold of that guilt and actually communicate that they actually finally can do something. You know, they should obviously you should have been doing this 40 years ago or whenever, but finally you can do something. Yes, you can sell your perfume, but you can actually do something good at the same time. So I think it's a brilliant, you know, it, it, you know what's happening with you guys on the stage and everything in this, this event is, is brilliant. That's, yeah, there you go. But prey on the guilt. Uh, I also- th I paid him. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. On, on, on your point, it, it's um, like the clients need to change, like their KPIs need to change because it's all about selling. Like the point of the ad agency is to get more money for the client and sell more products. That ROI needs to change. It needs to be more kind of community driven. It needs to be focused elsewhere. Um, and it's a, it's a hard thing to do. Like we're, we're looking at community initiatives and coming out of lockdown, it's been hard for everyone. So we give the studio away for free to creatives to initiate their own projects. And we do our own self-funded projects, which are eco, like we've looked into, like Drew was mentioning polyboards. Like we've got a prototype here, which is never gonna probably work, but it's made of my mycelium. And I thought I'd bring it just because we've invested a lot of time in it, on it. And it's interesting, but without taking those steps even to fail, or maybe just fall, because we're not failing, then we can just take that fall and get up again. Like, we need to change the outlook, because you're right, advertising is the place where we can change people's agenda. Um, yeah, we need just need to switch it. Any other questions? Yes, that guy. Can I, while we're getting the mic over, can I just say, there's something really special about failing in sustainability. If you, if you aren't currently failing, you aren't experimenting enough to get us where we need to be. You knocked my mic out, dude. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's a bit loud. I'm going to have to move, aren't I? Um, okay. Um, no, that's scary. Um, so I, th I think just feeding off of Kai's point um, around our industry, and I get that a lot of clients may talk about wanting to change, wanting to do things that are more environmental, but essentially they want to do just really good work. And I'm not sure if this is a question or not, but I've had the pleasure of working with a couple of you on stage. And I think something that's not really been said is that you are kind of experts in your field. And so whether there's a sense of responsibility of you guys dragging clients, kicking and screaming into that kind of area around, you know, being more eco-minded. I mean, do you guys feel that? I, you know, 
I, I think they wouldn't do anything otherwise, would they? I think it would. It would depend how early on in the process we were engaged as to whether we could influence change uh, or, or the route that you went. Does that make sense? So if you, 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 you have the idea, you've entered that discussion with your client. Once that's a ten, tangible idea, that's when you're coming out to us. And it's whether we could change that idea or evoke change at that point in order to, for it to be a more sustainable outcome. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. But essentially, you, you, they, we want to work with, you know, yeah. masters of their field. So we would want to work with you and you're adding, I don't want to call it an add-on, but it kind of is to clients, really, isn't it, in terms of that ecological aspect. And hopefully that will change and then become the norm. There, so, are, there are more and more suppliers, creatives out there that are refusing to work with clients who aren't doing enough. Uh, that's, that's part of what I often talk about is, well, we're just gonna stop working with these guys. That's it, just one client. Just stop working with that one client who isn't, you just know they're never gonna make those steps. So I, I think there are people that are moving that direction, just going, you know what, I can, I can fill in one client. Maybe next year I could fill in two clients and all of a sudden I have a whole ecosystem around me of people actually with me on the journey. Like you can, you can see what's happening here. Creatives in the room, here are your suppliers. All of a sudden there's an ecosystem. The power is there and the momentum's there. Can I just say as well that um, we have the choice to work with clients that maybe meet our ethical credentials or whatever, but also we're in an incredibly privileged position to also influence those who aren't e eco-friendly. And I could quit and I could say, I'm not gonna work with that, that person because they're not eco-friendly enough. Or I could use my influence within working with them to show them and convince them. And there's no one else that's gonna do that except for me by actually going onto set, showing how I'm doing it, how I'm doing it, how I'm making the changes. And I think that in turn is a really strong way to, to get change to happen. Um, Always take the meeting. If they're genuine, go for it. <laughs> Uh, any other questions? You guys over here, come on. These guys are winning. <laughs> Uh-oh. Hello. Um, just off the back of what this gentleman said here, there's a group in the ad industry called the Purpose Disruptors, yes. who are the real deal. And they are. their statement on the website says that advertising was complicit in creating uh, the climate crisis. But if the advertising industry has the skills and the talent to create the problem. They've got the still skills and the talent to find the solutions. So the purpose disruptors, check them out. They're amazing. They're feeding into ad net zero. They're all about turning ad industry into a, a purpose, uh, purpose for good. Absolutely. Uh, all right, well, so wrapping up, I thought, why don't we do a one thing, right? What is the one takeaway that each of you would want someone to leave here today? Either make the change, have the thought. What might it be? I would like to try and encourage the advertising industry to use and feature worn and pre-loved clothing and to use clothes that have patches, make it a feature um, and normalize it. We have a massive impact through our choices of what we use on screen in the advertising industry from using a keep cup to a reusable water bottle, um, no plastic on any advertising pictures. Um, and yeah, just simple things like that, like people reusing, reusing their clothes for longer would be a massive thing for me. So from production, post-production point of view is bringing that to the forefront where creative is, because there can be a lot of uh, initiatives for like value given to the client, both on cost savings, environmental, they, it's all entwined. Um, that's what I would say is push that more upstream. Uh, I'm going to say reflect and challenge. I think reflect on what you do and how you do it and challenge the process as to whether you can do it better. Um, I would say whether it's Grip Van, whether it's another co rental company, speak to them as early as possible. Um, there's a huge wealth of knowledge in those companies that can recommend the most efficient way of achieving what you need. Um, and not only in terms of the equipment, but the more notice, the earlier you get us involved, 
the more efficient we can be with transport, you know, we can make sure stuff's available. We don't have to run around collecting sub hires last minute. We can try and combine deliveries so that the footprint for your delivery is shared with somebody else. So the earlier you can speak to your equipment company, to your, to your gaffers, the better. All right, and I think I'll do a little bit of a, a, a wrap up of, of the day on this. I'm gonna start with Angus's shout out to me earlier in the Premier Inn comment, oh my God, way to put me on the spot, but I have the answer. Uh, which there's two organizations, one is called Stays and one is called Good Wings. They're both trying to compete with the sort of Expedias and Booking.coms of this world. They are both trying to tackle this in their own ways, uh, uh, but they are showing the, the estimated carbon of your hotel booking already, and so you can make good decisions when you're comparing hotels. And also, uh, if you go through me, I can get you a discount. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So uh, I, I thought um, it's important to mention that there are other calculators to do other things. So if you're struggling, if something doesn't quite fit, there's so many calculators out there and it's important just to start on that measurement process. Um, and again, uh, happy to sh help with that. And I thought it was interesting looking at Angus's numbers earlier on these smaller shoots, relatively smaller shoots, right? And I was thinking about my time running a studio, and I had this small boutique studio, two and a half studios in total, and we had over 400 shoots a year plus extra. That's 400 tons of carbon, 200 tons of carbon, something around there, coming in and out of our one tiny little shoot uh, studio, right? And that's actually 400 shoots, so you multiply that by the amount of days, those multi-day shoots. That's a lot more, and that's one footprint there. Uh, so think about what that means for everybody that's in the audience, all of these shoots that come out of here. Um, and finally, I wanted to kind of top it all off by thinking about what advertising is and what we <coughs> used to think of it as, right? We used to think of like Mad Men. Remember those guys, right? Oh my God, today we talked about kindness, sensitivity, caring, collaboration, transparency, those, it, those are just out there already now. They're waiting for you, right? This is the new advertising agency uh, uh, industry. Who knew? So uh, uh, be bold when you're going out there and probably somebody else in the room is already wanting to use those words as well. So thank you very much for coming. Thanks to amazing panelists, Drew from Grip Van, Liam from Perma. <laughs> Kai from Bad Star and Alice from the Styling Bank. Thank you so much. It's been great. Thanks to the AOP. Yes, let's have a beer. <laughs>I also want to obviously say a huge thank you as well to Roxy and to Angus, to Big Sky for this fantastic studio. I know Angus put in a huge amount of effort into putting on this, this wonderful setting that we have here, which really made me think when I walked in, wow, my God, this is what a live event is like. But again, I think everybody's had such a, a, a great session today and it's just a huge thank you to you both very, very much, and obviously to Big Sky and the whole team, the AV team, everybody behind the scenes. You've all done a fantastic job, so thank you very much again today. Thanks to the AOP. <laughs>